Hey everybody, starting up in just a few minutes. Just gonna get us started in a second. Oops, lost my remote control. Balthazar, that's there on my computer. No. Cool. Look, I'm missing my lights. Where are my lights? I need to turn them on. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon, Comp 1720, 6720. Welcome to week four and a big congratulations on finishing the first assignment. Um, it's really, really impressive to me uh, how everybody has gotten together and got that assignment organized. I know it seems like maybe it was just a little bit of work, but um, it's significant effort to get used to our system of submitting assignments with GitLab. And I just think that everyone deserves a bit of a pat on the back, particularly those who have never really taken a coding course before or who think that, or perhaps have taken some coding but never had to handle Git. So it's quite a learning curve. It's certainly something that when we were doing in-person labs, we were um, able to give you a lot more targeted help with all of that. And now that we're doing remote labs, we have to, um, try to give you the, the support um, in a slightly different way. And so just a pat on the, bat all, pat on the back all around. Um, I've had a look at the submissions already 
um, there are some really, really interesting ones. And I think that the, uh, the tutors and myself who are marking it are going to have a lot of fun looking at all of the cool things that you've created. So I'm not going to say too much more about assignment one. I'm just going to jump right into this lecture for today. I think we're just streaming. I'm just going to check that actually I have the, whoa, stay on that page. Thank you. Don't leave that. Is everything looks like going okay here? Like, do I look like myself? I'm probably big, right? Not small. <laughs> Make sure my YouTube stream is working. Sometimes I worry that my streams just like stop in the middle. My channel. Is it happening? It says live now. I like to look at my channel and see that there's like actually a picture of me. There I am. Cool. So it's working. Great. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure, you know, <laughs> would be a bit of a poor lecture if I actually did not do the lecture and just uh, talk to you folks. Just make sure I'm recording. Yeah. Cool. We're ready to go. We are ready to go. Um, I've already congratulated you on the assignment, but I'm going to congratulate you again. Very well done on getting that assignment sorted out. So I've already got a comment from, from Benedict. Um, the the marks for assignment one will be coming in two weeks. We are going to work double speed to get your marks back to you because I think that um, even more than the, the exact mark for name tag, you'll get some feedback um, from us on how you're going with your coding, how you're going with writing an artist statement, and how you're going at conceptualizing an artwork, which is really a very important part of this course. It's not just about coding. Uh, of course, it's about putting it together into an artistic uh, output. So we'll give you some feedback and you'll need that feedback for your assignment two, which has now been released. Assignment two is available on the deliverables page. It's going to be due on Monday, first Monday of the teaching break at 9, p 9 p.m. I've forgotten what kind of a day that is right now, but I assure you that it's due on that day. Um, that means you have another couple of weeks to do it. Really, again, the, the three assignments for this course are not that huge, um, but they have a building on each other and we do expect you to improve your process of conceptualizing a piece of art in each one of them. So assignment two, your goal is to create an interactive picture window. I've got it up in a tab. I'm just going to show you that. Here we go. Got our assignments, interactive picture window, telling a story through a window. Um, the the difference here is that in assignment one, you really only had to make a static image and save it as a PNG. And in assignment two, not only does it have to be a dynamic scene or, or a dynamic um, activity in your screen, but it has to be interactive. Okay, so it does need to have some um, interactive elements so that you can, you know, perhaps use the mouse to, to move things around and see what's happening. So um, I will let you folks read that on your own. I'm sure I'll come back to you next week with a few, a few ideas or suggestions, um, but it's identical process to assignment one. You have to fork a repo on GitLab. You have to make your changes in that repo. You have to upload your artist statement. You have to fill out a statement of originality. You need to fill out, even if you think there's nothing that you've used which is unoriginal in your artwork, Find something unoriginal and put it in there just so you've got something to talk about in your statement of originality uh, and then upload it to us. Our test server will be available for you to see your artworks as well and share them with your friends because it's always fun to show off what you're doing, um, particularly after the assignment is finished so that we uh, don't have any undue collaboration. Although it's this is the kind of course where everyone is going in different directions. So collaboration between students is not such a big deal for our assignments if everyone's doing something different, really. Um, final assignment there. Are, I guess I've got this slide which has all the assessment for this course now because you're well on your way to doing your assessments. Assignment three is yet to come, but it will again be a similar scale of work with some more elements um, that we're learning as we go. Uh, it's going to be due, I think, in week nine. So it's kind of dividing the, the semester into four quarters. And then after that, you'll have your major project due at the end of week 12. Now, so far, I haven't said a lot about the major project, but it's a big deal, really. Um, the assignments are small and the major project is big. 
The major project is worth 50% of the marks for this course, so it's an important piece of work. Um, the scale of it should be larger and you need to take advantage of all of the skills that you've learned across the term. And for that reason, in the first half of the course, we talk a lot about coding techniques. And in the second half, we're mainly talking about the major project because we need to build up your skills in conceptualizing an artwork, structuring an artwork, and making sense of the interactive and technical elements that you're putting in there with P5. Now, the announcement is that, well, I guess the context here is every artwork major project we do in this course, the major projects always have a theme. And the major project theme this week, or this year, not this week, this week I'm announcing the theme this year is Fearful Symmetry. Fearful Symmetry. So, <laughs> I know that that may seem interesting when you look at that. I wonder what your, your feeling is. If you've got a first, first impression, chuck it in the chat. I'd love to hear from you. I actually had a, a little competition with a number of themes. Um, I thought of a bunch of themes that we could use and shared it with the tutors and Tony. And we had a bit of a vote to see which would come out. And we decided on this one, Fearful Symmetry. Does anyone know where this, these two words come from. There are famous two words, so it's not something which is just, you know, randomly choosing in the dictionary <laughs> two, two random words. Uh, but I'll let you folks uh, have a bit of a chance to think on that one. <laughs> Maybe you, no one's uh, jumped in with a, a uh, Suggestion. Um, Benedict has just asked me how scary this is allowed to be. Well, I think we do have a, an FAQ rule for the major project that it has to be appropriate for the workplace. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Benedict is using the kind of um, Australian <laughs> ratings classification of keeping it with an, an, an M rating. Um, yeah, I think that an M rating would be appropriate. You know, we're in a workplace with, um, in general, uh, grown-ups, but uh, someone's got it. Yes, a prize for Molly from the Tiger. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, you can, you can make something scary, but I think that's, that making it a horror film isn't always what fearful means. So I think that these two words, in addition to having a kind of um, a cultural impact because they're from a poem, but they also have a, um, they have this feel about them that they can be interpreted in a lot of ways. And that's what we're looking for in a, a theme for a major project. Because as I said before, our expectation in this course is that everybody is going in different directions. So I don't want to have a theme which is like, taking everyone towards the same conclusion. This is a theme that, that, um, that spreads everybody out, uh, right? Um, so just a, a bit of context of this, where did these two words come from? Um, Molly had this in the chat. It's from a poem called The Tiger, which is written by an author called William Blake in um, I think like late 1700s. I'm just reading it off Wikipedia right now, remembering it's from 1794, so it's a very old poem in, in English. And it's old enough that like some of the words are spelled all wrong compared to our, our modern way of looking at it. Um, but it's, it doesn't have the same feeling of being like a horror film, that kind of fear in the poem. But you can interpret it that way if you wish. So there's one thing which is about an emotion, fearful. Are we the ones who are, fear, are feared of something or is it the, the thing which is scary itself? or is it some other interpretation of that? And symmetry, which I guess is, is something which we don't connect always with fearfulness or horror or fright, um, but it's something we do connect with art. So if you can incorporate both those, find an interpretation for both those words and incorporate them in your major project, I think you'll think of some great things to do. So uh, exploring both the design aspects of this and the emotional aspects are probably gonna be exciting for everybody. 
Okay, I'm not going to go into huge amount of details about that right now. I just wanted to introduce the theme. You folks can have a, a chatting with me in the chat, which is excellent. Um, the, I think Benedict has just posted the poem in the chat. Uh, tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye? Um, what's the next line? What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? And that's a sight rhyme, right? You'd think it should be, could frame thy fearful symmetry, but that's not how we say symmetry. So the Y is the rhyme, but it doesn't sound that way. Almost forgot the last line of the tiger there, which is tragic. Um, okay, back to coding. This is coding time with Charles, not poetry time with Charles. Maybe I can do another lecture on poetry for you. Recap, just the recap slide. What have we done so far? We've learned how to specify positions and colors with numbers. That's the fundamental skills of painting with P5, doing stuff with some of the P5 libraries, um, maybe drawing with rect and ellipse, setting colors, fill and stroke. We've used some variables, var x, var y, var something else. We've done some simple maths. We've used some if statements, some conditionals. Um, someone just posted on, on uh, I think overheard at ANU or someone, someone sent me a meme on the, the chat which was like, what's a good if statement? What's a sentence with an if statement? And the, someone came up with, if you wanna be my lover, you gotta get with my friends. So I wish I'd thought of that last week. So oh, it's tragic. I'll have to remember for next year when I can do it first in the semester. Um, the, someone has suggested now using Eye of the Tiger for their major project theme. I suppose you could do that as well. Doing things conditionally with if statements and Boolean expressions, very, very important. Using things that change that are interactive like mouse X, mouse Y, and then using loops like while and for, very important. So we've done almost all, well, we're almost getting through the code topics for this course. Um, but today I've got two more concepts for you, or three more concepts actually, three more important concepts. So these are the three important concepts, variable scope, functions, and arrays. So functions, we've talked a little bit about functions already as commands, but the difference now is that we're gonna make our own. Variable scope is, is something you may have started to notice and we'd, um, we would uh, go into that in a bit more detail today. And then arrays is where you've got a lot of things, too many things to have individual variable names for them but you wanna keep them collected together. So we can show you how to do that. Okay, scope, what does that mean, scope? If I look through a telescope, I can see like a limited number of things, right? <laughs> I guess this is uh, story time with Charles right now. If we looked through this telescope right here, we wouldn't be able to see the whole scene of the beach sides. We'd be able to see a small part, but zoomed in. So a scope has this kind of the word scope has this meaning or connection with like limiting off an area of the world or an area of something. So the scope of a project is the area of the project that you're considering. If something's out of scope, that means we're not considering that. So it's out of, out of our hands. We don't need to worry about it. What does scope mean when we're in a uh, programming language? So it's, it's related to that same concept, but it's a way of talking about which bits of code can sort of see each other or which bits of code are aware of each other. And actually when we're doing programming, we might have lots of bits of code or quite large programs and each program only has a very limited awareness. So we think of our programs, even though they may look like one big program, we're thinking about them as lots of little programs which are kind of independent, um, which is a good thing. It makes our, our programs uh, sort of more predictable and easy to work with and it's generally considered to be good practice to work like that, have little small encapsulated bits of programs. Now, if you've ever had a few missing variable errors, if you started to experiment with VARs, you might have come across some doing something when your code doesn't work and you don't know why. You might have a scope problem. So you can see you've made a variable, but somehow the bit of code that you want to use the variable can't and it's a bit worrying why that would happen. Let's give a bit of a demo in a minute. So we can have a kind of, it, in JavaScript as in many languages, um, we can have this global scope. So 
global scope is like you've zoomed out and you're looking at the entire world all in front of you so you can see everything that there is to consider and the global scope is actually where you when you define a variable outside of all the functions in your project even outside of setup and outside of draw that means that you've made this variable in the global scope that means they're visible from anywhere in the program that needs to see it um, here's an example we've got x var x equals 200 and x is a global variable so it's going to be visible to any piece of code that you write within your p5 sketch anything inside setup and anything inside draw so that's fine we can totally do that no problem what about this one we've got function setup create a canvas then it's got var x and then we want to draw an ellipse x x x x let me uh Let's try it out. I'll just get my screen smaller. Let's try it out. Just going to go live over here. I've got my background here. I'm just going to make a different background. I might make it white background 255 or sort of light gray 200. Okay, so far so good. I've got a nice gray background. I'll just put myself on the left over here so that I'm uh, not in the way. And I'm going to make my variable here, var x equals 200. Okay, I've made a variable x. Now I'm going to use it. Ellipse. I'll just do, change the fill to be black. Ellipse uh, x. It's going to be a ellipse that starts at 200, 200 and is 200 wide and 200 tall so in fact it's a circle and let's see what happens absolutely nothing indeed well that's no good now this might have happened to you you've done something in your code you changed something you've had a good idea you changed something and then you press save and look in your window and absolutely nothing appears on the screen and you may be thinking at this point maybe my computer is broken and I should throw it in the bin and get another one but but we are learning to be computer programmers here. So you don't have to throw out your computer when something goes wrong because you have the skills to fix it. So I would encourage you not to, not to jump to conclusions. The conclusions that are, you shouldn't jump to include my computer is broken, I'm broken, my computer hates me, um, my computer has been taken over by an evil spirit. All of these things, I suppose, are very remote possibilities. It's more... a, a more probable that in fact you have made a very small mistake in your code and <laughs> a very small mistake in your code but your um, your software your browser just can't get past it it can't figure out what you're trying to do um, Benedict has just asked me a very good question I'm going to explain that answer in a minute but if you want to see what's going on what we need to look at is the console, the web console. And if you're on Firefox on uh, Mac or Windows, that you can access this by pressing Control Shift K or by going into this web developer menu. And this gives you a, an important um, bit of information about how your program is working. And in particular, if you've got a little, a little red exclamation mark here, it means something's gone wrong. Little yellow exclamation marks are a warning, and usually that means that there's not too much wrong, but <laughs> something is perhaps wrong. I would say to you that in this course, don't worry about that too much. In other courses in computing, you may have to sweat the details and make sure every warning is cleared, but warnings, not too bad. Errors, they are going to cause problems. So the, the error here is that X is not defined. And you're thinking, well, x is very much defined. I defined it right here, var x equals 200. But we have to remember the scope. What's the scope of this variable x? Well, if it was defined within this function, we would be able to see it. So I take it back here, define it there. Now we're fine, it can see x. What if I define it out here? Global variable x. That's fine too. So it's really only 
The problem is when we have x within setup and we, we define it or we declare the variable x within setup and then use it in draw, that's not going to work. We can actually declare it globally, set it in setup and then use it in draw. This is okay. It's the declaration bit which sets the scope, where you de declare a variable. Yeah, this is fine. Okay, so now we've learned something about, about both the console, the JavaScript console. I'm making a point of it today because I'm going to use it a few times. The JavaScript console and variable scope. Cool. <clears throat> so, I made this point already, but if something is not working, you'll want to check the console. Now just, um, whoops, I did this, I showed you that. This is good, you can go back and revise it later, but I've already told you these details. Um, a few scoping tips. Scoping might cause frustration for you at first, but actually the scope of your code is a good thing, the fact that there is scope. It means that little bits of your code can be isolated and it makes it clearer. It also means that code is more robust. Just a, as a simple example, suppose you used in your code a variable called x, and then you wanted to combine your processing sketch with someone, or your P5 sketch with someone else's one. So you copied all the code from their sketch together into your sketch. And as it happens, your friend's sketch also uses a variable called x, but you'd used x for different things. Now, if everyone declared all their variables as global, then they would run into each other because you, you would be using X, your friend's code would be using X and it, they would be messing each other's values up, right? You'd be changing it, they'd be using it. Both of you would be unhappy. But if they're separated, then um, it means that you're, they won't be stepping on each other's toes. Suppose your X was in a function and their X was just in a function declared within that function, then the scope would be sort of um, limited in each case. Now, how we define scope is to do with the brackets. So if we've got code inside these brackets, that's called a block. That's kind of defining a scope. So make sure that you're, in this case, our var x is declared, set, and used within a block. So that's fine. Everyone's happy with the scope. Okay, now before, I'm going to go on to functions, but Benedict asked me just before, I have a question about those two functions, setup and draw. Are these functions called somewhere else? They absolutely are, and they're called inside the actual process, the, P, the JavaScript code that defines um, the, uh, that defines the P5 language. So JavaScript is this big language. It kind of is a, a big circle, a big scope. And then P5 is a little library that works within it. Now, the P5 library, when you set up a sketch in P5, we can see how this is done within this index.html. It's the website that actually plays back our sketch. This website loads in the code for P5 right there, a p5.js file. And then it runs your JavaScript code in this uh, sketch and inserts it in this web page, inserts what you're trying to draw. But the p5.js library not only provides you with all these tools like ellipse and rect and fill and stroke, but it also defines when setup gets called, which is right at the start of your sketch running, and then it calls draw once every 30th of a second or once every frame. So it's going to keep updating that draw function. So it's there the are two functions which are uh, required to be used and because they're what p5 is expecting to call to actually draw your sketch. If we declare a variable in draw and use it then declare the same variable in a different function would it cause a problem? That's a very very good question Peter. Let's do what I like to do and try it out. I'm not sure. I'm not uh, a JavaScript expert by any means so and there are sometimes things about JavaScript functions which wig me out. I'm going to call var x and define it here. Comment that one out. 
var x equals 200. So if it doesn't change, you now we'll see what happens. We'll see, have a look at the console and see what, whether we get into any issues here. Now it seems happy. Seems like we're allowed to do that. Um, you can have var x declared. In fact, these days we're really meant to use let. Let x. It's let is the new var. <laughs> um, JavaScript is kind of a moving target. There was, there's various revisions to it. It was developed in the, in the 90s um, originally and then sort of edited over time and then eventually people came up with a standardization in the last few years called ECMAScript 6, I think. And the ES6 um, specification for how JavaScript should work includes this new way of getting a function called let, which is important for scope. So no issues there. We can use let x here. We can let x here. We can var x in both places. And it does what we expect. That seems good. So the thing to remember is that setup is only run once. So if we were, were going to do it, um, if we wanted to keep updating this, it's not going to mess up. So I suppose this is not a great example for that, but we might think of a better one later. Yep, someone has just said, I guess let is more intuitive. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's another thing. Benedict has been using neither var nor let, and that seems to work as well. Well, that's sometimes languages are set up so that you can use like, now that works, just an x by itself. But what if we do a complicated one, like x circle location, x circle location. No, it doesn't like that. I think this is this happens in a number of languages. To simplify matters, particularly for beginners, um, sometimes there is an idea that very simple variables are always declared, <laughs> which just breaks my brain. It's so, it's the opposite of helpful, right? It's anti-helpful because it means that if you're just going around using x, probably y works, a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i, j, k, l, m, n, o, p, q, r, x, t, u, z, v, w, x, w, y, and z, will all work. If you just use those variables, they're already declared for you. But then when you do anything else and you haven't declared it, you run into an error. And then if you're a learner, you don't know what to do. So Benedict, you've been, you've been using a, a valid feature, but um, the feature, I would not suggest you do that. I would suggest that you always let, let. There we go. Oh, we're talking about scope so much. Yeah, I think that's right. Benedict says, I think it implicitly is global. Um, Jarvis has just asked about prefixes like private, public for Java. I, I don't even know Jarvis. <laughs> you can go and tell me about the answer to that. I, at the moment in this course, we're really using JavaScript in quite a simple way. So the kind of, um, detailed scoping you would do in Java is a bit out of uh, out of scope for this course, um, but we can you can talk about it and do some research and tell me the answer. Okay, functions. We're moving on to functions now. No more scope. First, a few definitions. What what is a function so far? Well, what do we understand it to be? I think in lecture one I was talking about functions and I always said a function. Well, that's like a command. So you're telling something to do something. And what are some other meanings of functions? Well, a function of something is its duty or its calling or its, its role. Um, but in computing, a function is usually defined to be this sequence of program instructions that do a specific task and it's packaged up as a unit. And why do we, do, why do we call it that? Well, it's also called a subroutine or a procedure. There's lots of words for this, this kind of idea sometimes subtle differences between those, those words, but for now we can treat them all as one thing. It's good when you're writing a program, if you've got a sequence of instructions that you use all the time, you can package it up somewhere and then your program, rather than having to have those instructions in many times to use it, they can always just go back to this special location where you've stored that procedure of or that sequence of instructions. 
So that's what a function is. It's a place in your program where you set aside a sequence of program instructions and you're going to go there and come back repeatedly to do this task over and over again. You can reuse those bit lines of code. That's really excellent. Their functions are great. We want to use them and to simplify our life. Here's what a function looks like so far. You know this, you've seen it many times. Functions have a name like rect or ellipse. Then they've got some parameters, which are the bits of information that you're giving to that function to do its job. So the name specifies what to do, what lines of code to be running, and the parameters tell the function how to do it. What kind of thing, information does it need to do its job? So together, these two things let the computer do a thing over and over again, and you can customize it each time. So it's very useful for, for building your code. <laughs> Jarvis is saying we should use lots of classes and define functions within a class. Uh, you're, you're, we're not talking about classes yet. We may never talk about them. <laughs> Speak the lingo. This is a function as well, by the way. There's a bunch of people holding wine glasses or a uh, beverage of their choice, um, clinking them together, and they're all together at a function, which is sort of <laughs> another word another use of that word that we're not meaning when we talk about functioning computing. The, the word, what we're meaning to do, we call a function that because we're kind of commanding it to do its job. So the staff at, at a function would have a function, like a waiter would go around and you'd say, waiter, I want a glass of grape juice. And they would bring you one, right? They have a function, you're giving them a parameter, the kind of drink you want, and they go and get it. So how many jobs would a function have, right? And we have this principle in computing of like each function kind of having one job. So it's good style to make um, your functions kind of short, just do one thing. And then you run your program by kind of putting all the functions together. And I think um, Jarvis in the chat has just been suggesting that that's how they have been writing their programs in P5. It's a good idea to encapsulate little bits of code within functions and then call them one by one. Oh, we don't need to talk about this too much, but how would you find out what the parameters mean if you saw a function that you don't know? You might not know what these 100s are referring to. The answer, of course, is to look at the reference. Um, I've told you that many times. Can you write your own functions? We've been using a bunch of functions all along, setup, draw, as well as ones like ellipse. But you can also write your own to do a specific task. This is what Jarvis was talking about um, in terms of using functions to simplify your life when you're creating your code. So here is a good one, polka dots. All we have to do to make a function is type the word function in our code, type the name, and then our x and y, and then we can do this little uh, this little bit of programming to, to make it work. I'm actually going to work on a bit of code today. I think I might start it with you right now. Um, this is going to be my kind of um, functions and arrays demo. So <laughs> you get two in one. I'm going to get rid of all my my and my scoping demo. Get rid of everything. We're starting with a blank slate. And what I want to do is, I'll close that. I'm just gonna draw one thing, which maybe fill 252550. What color is that? R plus G, that's gonna be yellow. And I'm going to make an ellipse at a location, 100, 100, 10, 10. So I got a little yellow circle in my code, a little yellow circle. And I could, I can take this, these two lines of code and abstract them to make lots of yellow circles. And I'm actually going to, I'm not going to make polka dots. I'm going to call them a bug, draw a bug, x, y, and then another function, another parameter, b for their brightness. So I'm going to change my brightness to B, B, 
zero. So they're always yellow, but just sort of different levels of brightness of yellow. And then they will be at location X, location Y, 10, 10. Okay. So now I've made my function draw bug. I can then call it draw bug. And I get something which is almost exactly the same. So at this point, I haven't, haven't made any big improvements to my code. But let's think, what if I wanted to draw several bugs? Well, now I can take this, rather than having to copy this each time, I can take this code and just draw a couple. And maybe I want them to be in random locations, random width, random heights, and maybe a something which is kind of bright, but a bit different. Oh, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now if I do this, someone's screaming at me on their screen saying, no, don't do that, you'll get bugs everywhere, right? They'll be jumping around because I'm using the draw function, draw plus random, random things within draw, because draw is getting looped over and over and over, your random numbers will always be changing. So <laughs> it's, uh, we'll get a different number each time. I'm just gonna show what happens. Whoa, they're going crazy there. I don't want that. That's not really what I wanted. I'm actually gonna put them in setup for now, and we're just gonna have nothing in draw. Because I just wanna make one, one group of six bugs. And I can make more bugs, so if I wanted 12, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We've got a whole constellation of little bugs. Now the cool thing here is that even though I've set up this rather complex amount of code here, or several lines of code, if I want to change how I draw a bug, I can change it all at once. So suppose I wanted to add, to kind of change how the bugs are drawn, maybe making them a little bit different in size, so we get a 10 plus random two, and 10 plus random two. Now I can make a change in the function, and then every time I call it, that, will, that change will be applied. So I've made my life easier now by abstracting, as we say, I've abstracted this idea of drawing the bug from the bit in my code where I'm actually doing it. So now they're all slightly different sizes, and they're slightly different um, different brightnesses as well. <laughs> when ADS TV loses the signal, yep, that's very true. <laughs> yeah, so far, so far, so far, so far, it's been pretty good to, uh, pretty easy to do this process over and over again, but I suppose it's hard to do it a hundred times, I'd have to keep copying this out. As we learned last week, I think we can possibly help ourselves by using a loop. And the kind of loop I'm gonna use is a for loop. So I'm gonna use a for, actually a, a for loop, I'm gonna use the var i, even though I probably don't have to, thanks to Benedict. Var i equals zero. Oops, there we go. i less than 100, so I'm gonna do 100 bugs. i plus plus. Now I'm not actually using this i, I'm just using it as a counter to make sure I do it 100 times. It goes zero up until 99 and then stops. So it's 99 plus one, that's 100 times. There we go, 100 bugs. And if I wanted, in fact, I just see that I've made a little, a stroke on the edge of my bugs. So I might wanna actually turn that off. I can easily do that by changing the function. There goes my stroke. If I want 500 bugs, all I have to do is change that. Right now it's gonna be bug city. <laughs> Too many bugs. No, they're taking over 10,000 bugs. Ah. Okay, so we don't want bug overload, but this just goes to show how useful a function is because now that I've defined my code separately, I can use that in lots of places in my program. I can loop with it and it just makes my code much more read readable. 
And in particular, it's nice to use functions. Another good thing, this is a little bit like human psychology, but if I'm reading your code, I don't know what your code does until I start poking it and looking very carefully. But if you use a function and you call your function draw bug, now I know what your code does because you've named it, right? It's kind of nice to name things. Draw bug, it means I'm gonna draw a bug now. And I think, oh, now I see the result. I'm like, oh, those little things must be bugs. That makes sense. But if I just had this code inside the loop and it didn't say draw bug, I wouldn't know what it means. I suppose you could put a comment there, but if, if you are using a function and you don't have a comment, your code documents itself because you've named it. Okay, moving on now, moving on. We've got 10,000 bugs and that's probably enough bugs. We'll do more bugs later. Yes, I was we were doing starry backgrounds last week, so I'm doing bugs this time, not starry backgrounds. Um, <laughs> we can also have value functions that give back values. Um, this is, uh, some, some, in some courses, you'll use functions like this all the time, and in, in P5, we're more like doing little procedures that we want to loop over, but um, the, uh, I'll do draw microbe in a minute, but the, if you use this return statement, that means that you are giving back a piece of information, right? So, oh, not that, that's my, whatever I'm doing. This, this random, random is a function and random is giving me back a number. So in the definition of random, the last line of that will be return a number. Um, so it's taking whatever, some calculation you've done and giving it back to whoever has called the function. So 10 plus random two means we're adding a number to 10. So we're using that number. Even if draw bug had a return variable, a return returned a number or something, we're not using it. So it would just sort of disappear. It's like you're, you're, you receive something, but you just don't use it. You just uh, want to call the, uh, call the behavior of the function. Now, there's a few other special functions in P5, mouse pressed and key pressed. I think you've been working on mouse pressed in your, your lab this week, right? Just remembering the labs for a minute. Week four lab, yes, you were doing, doing clicking in different places, right? Using buttons. So you've worked on mouse pressed, you know about key pressed as well because that's how it receives the space bar um, to take a picture of your name tag in your name tag sketch. Um, so those two are, are special functions to find out a bit of information, find out whether the mouse button is down or not, and then return you a Boolean number, uh, Boolean value about it. So those are really useful functions. And if you need to know more about functions, use the reference, a great doc. I should probably read that in more detail and someone will tell me some details that otherwise Benedict and Jarvis will tell me next week. A few different comments there. I'm not going to skip, skip over this. You can read that later. It's uh, just some more details and an example. I already did an example. Now we get to our third concept for the day, arrays, arrays. And there's a picture here of many lamps of similar styles. So supposing you were making a lamp sketch in P5 and you needed to store the location in X and Y and the style of each of these lamps, then using different variables for each one of these lamps would start to get tedious because there would be so many all over your sketch. How many lamps are there here? There's thousands. It's okay with the bug situation because when I had 10,000 bugs, I didn't need to, to go back and look at them afterwards. I was just wanted to draw them and then throw them away. But if we want to keep something, keep a variable around, and we need to keep like more than a few of them, then we need some way to kind of collect them and refer to them, um, not by like a name, having to name every single one, but prefer, perhaps refer to them by number. I am not a number, I am a man. Um, but we're gonna to refer to them by number. I know that's kind of, you know, dystopian futury, but, um, we're going to refer to things by numbers in arrays. Now we've already met these types, number, string, and boolean. 
um, so far where you had individual variables. But our idea is now to collect those individual variables together. Here's how you do it. Here's how we do. Var array of numbers equals square bracket, and this is the important bit, then a list of numbers, 100, 24, minus 2, 18, 106, 42, 1, 8. Close, square bracket, and then semicolon. So that is our first array. Here's another array, var array of strings. Hello darkness, my old friend. And each string is one word, and they're a collection. They also have an important order. If it was old darkness friend my hello, it wouldn't be, make as much sense as hello darkness my old friend, which is the first line of a famous song called The Sound of Silence by Simon Garfunkel. The, so the order of an array is, is important, as well as the fact that these things are collected together. We've got an array of booleans. There's not too many options with booleans, but it's, it's sometimes important to have a list of them. True, false, true, true, false. So what can we tell from, from these three examples? Well, the elements of an array can all be the same type, but in this fourth example, they can also be of different types. 100, 200, false, banana. So we've got numbers, booleans, and strings together. We can have an array which is empty, empty array, just a open bracket, close bracket, that's fine too. I'll, there's a reason to have an empty array, I'll show you in a minute. The elements of an array are in an order, and that order is set and stable. It can be changed, but it's not going to be not changed without you knowing about it. We can have, even though we have only two values of a boolean, you can have arrays which are longer than two, right? There's perhaps on a computer there could be some sort of data type which could only have unique values, but an array isn't like that. You can have the same value over and over again. True, 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 that could be an array. True, false, true, true, false is also an array, that's fine. They can also be all different numbers. There's no two numbers which are the same here. So these are a few facts about arrays. I know they seem like basic, but, but it's definitely true that you have to start, there's, sorry, there's different ways of storing information on computers and we need to know some of the properties of these things. So getting to use arrays, getting to understand what their properties are, become more important when you contrast an array with another kind of collection of objects. But we're only talking about arrays really now. So again, looking for matching pairs. I was telling you about the curly brackets being important before, but in an array, matching pairs are the important bit. The matching pair of square brackets. A few bits of vocab just to, to get in the brain old ticker working right now. The array refers to the whole collection, not just an individual element. Each member of an array is called an element. I think I just used the word element. That's an individual member of an array. The position of that element is called an index. It's called an index. Um, you can, and the index for an array starts at zero. And if you're new to computing and coding, the idea that things start at zero may be confusing, but that is the normal way for programmers to think about things. <laughs> um, the first element of an array is index zero and the second one is index one. Keep that in mind for later. Benedict has just asked if they have a fixed length. They do not, you can change their length. The number of elements in an array is called the length of an array. That's very important. Uh, that's, all the, that's all the vocab I've got. Um, now we're gonna have a few slides about using arrays. And what I might do is kind of flick over into demo mode as we go. So let's have a look at this example first. We've got a, an array called all the things. It starts an opening bracket and a close bracket. All the things, when I think all the things, I think all the things you are, and this is not anything to do with that song, so that's a shame. Um, it should be A flat as the first, first note, but that's a zero. We're declaring this variable called all the things, that's the first thing, declare. Then we initialize it, first to be an array, and secondly, that it's an array that has these three elements, zero, 
120, and 500. So that's great. It's a very simple array. It just has three elements. But it's, it's a good way now we've collected these three numbers together. We could use them for different purposes later. This is just the same as any other kind of variable. It's not, not complex, more complex than what we were doing in week two. We're declaring the variable using var. You can also use let. We've got its name, all the things. I have an equal sign for the initialization and then an array. And this array is just like one of those numbers. It's a literal, a literal array. This array just becomes itself. It never changes to something else unless we specifically change its variable to refer to a different one. Arrays are really, really useful. I'm, I'm going to, you can look at this in the slides later, but I think that the main reason you want to use arrays is that you have a, a bunch of things that you want to keep track of. <laughs> a bunch of things like those lamps and you need to keep track of their numbers. And what I'm going to get to is that at the moment in my code, I've made these bugs. I've drawn all the bugs, but now I've drawn them. They're gone. I can't change them. And what I want to do is an effect today. This is my goal. I want an effect where they kind of, if they're bugs that are glowing, maybe they should like fade in and out or something. And if I can't like find the bug again, if it's just disappeared, I can't change its value and I can't put it in the draw loop. <laughs> so I'm going to need to keep track of all of my locations and my bugs. And the way I'm going to do that is with arrays. It's going to be awesome. So just bear with me. We're going to learn a few tricks about arrays first. Oops. Here's some, these are some things you can do with them. You can find out how big they are. We're going to add, remove, modify elements. You can join arrays together if you want to. Have a look in the docs, the, the MDN docs for arrays, like this one. Um, should be here somewhere. Arrays. Array? Oh. Somewhere here. Built in objects, array. Have a look at these docs and see these different usages of array. Okay. Um, a, a simple array. We've got a simple array called odd numbers, and that's handy because it's going to contain the odd numbers. One, two, three, five, seven. Nothing complex going on here so far. What if I want to use an element? I just want to get one element out of it. Then we use square brackets again after the value itself to get an element. And we refer to each element by their index. So I, I said before we were going to talk about things, give everything a number. We number all of these odd numbers, starting with zero. We get the zeroth one, and that's the first one. The, the number one, index one, is going to be the second one. And we can use them for stuff, <laughs> like background, odd numbers, square brackets three. We can use it for something. I'll give you a demo in a minute. A few gotchas about referencing. First of all, they start at zero, as I keep saying. Second of all, if you don't have enough elements of the array, you'll get one of these errors, like odd numbers, square brackets 40, where it's undefined, will cause an error. Let's just see what happens. I'm going to copy this into my code. I'll make it up here. It's going to be a global variable. No, I told you not to do global variables, but I'm doing one. Too bad. Uh, it's going to make that zero, so I've got no, do, no bugs this time. And I'll try, actually, I'll try printing out one of these odd numbers, odd numbers. It's a good way to use the, to try out using the console is to print something. Uh, this print means it's going to just type it into the console for you. So I want to know what's at odd number zero. And I get that back, one. If I want odd numbers one, I'm probably on the wrong side. No, no, left hand side small, good. Odd numbers one. These aren't the odd numbers. Wait a minute. One, three, five, seven. I cannot let that stand to be wrong. Odd numbers three. I get back a seven from the, con the uh, console. Remember to get the console. If it's closed, you go Command Shift K and then it's open again. 
What if I do odd numbers 40? Undefined. <laughs> so actually, JavaScript is being rather nice to us because there's many languages where if you ask for a index of an array which is not there, everything stops and it doesn't work. So in this case, JavaScript is not completely stopping and breaking, it's just giving you undefined, which is a very kind thing to do really. Getting, just by the by, asking an array for an index for an element that it doesn't have is one of the most common mistakes you'll make in computing. It's a very easy mistake to make, I do it all the time, and it can cause all kinds of nightmares sometimes if you forget how that works. Okay, referencing, we've done that. How do we change things in the array? Well, if I want to just change one element, that's easy. I can suppose I have three. Oops. If I've got element three, that's zero, one, two, three. It should be seven. And I can see over here it definitely is seven. If I want to change that, what I can do is this odd numbers 3 equals 127,000. So now I've changed it to that. <laughs> I wonder what happens if I press print odd numbers. I can see them all. Oh yeah, it gives me the whole array. 1, 3, 5, 127,009. I still only want to see number 3. So this is where the print and the console is very useful. If you want to see what's going on in your code, you can use this to have a look at things, complicated things like arrays where you might start to forget what they are. It also has a length, which is handy. But there's other ways to put things into array, arrays. Sometimes you want to put things into an array that doesn't just replace an element, but you want to add it to the end. So if you want to push, put an element on the end of an array, we use this command, a function that belongs to arrays called push. And there's the link to the docs there if you want to look at that. So if I took odd numbers and pushed 53, and we can actually have do that in our code. Instead of odd numbers three being 127,000, I'm going to push onto the end. Now I get 13579127,000. That's really handy. What if we want to get it off the end, knock it off? The opposite of push in computing is a command called pop. <laughs> and it doesn't need to have a number, but we can set it to something. Let popped equal pop. And then after that, I'm going to print odd numbers. And then I'm going to print popped. So pop takes the, whatever is on the end of an array removes it from the array and returns it. So we can sort of grab it if we need it like that. Which is, it's a handy thing to do. It's, maybe it's a bit abstract as to why we'd need that right now, but it's a useful function. So we started with, with this array with 127,000 on the end. We popped it off. And then we just printed what we just popped. Now there's this is for putting things at the end of an array. If you want to put things at the start of an array, we can do that as well. Unfortunately, the words for putting things on the start are more annoying. Unshift is the command we need to put something on the start of an array. And the opposite of unshift is shift. I don't know why they're going to, they're called that, but that's just, it's, someone came up with, I was looking on the internet just before, why is it called shift and unshift? And someone came up with like a really nerdy reason why it could be that. I just can't believe it would be true to do with like the logical shift operation, which no, don't let it be that. Why did they choose those things? They're, they're not good choices, I would say. Okay, so we've sh unshifted. And why does unshift add it to the array? Ah, Unshift means we've, we've put 127,000 at the start of the array. And then we can shift it off the left-hand side, and we'll store it in that same popped variable. So then it's been shifted off, disappears, and we've got that by itself isolated. So now we can use an array to store a bunch of stuff we're doing, which is really, really handy. Um, in fact, what I could do is, uh, 
Now I'll, I'll do it in a minute. I'll give you a more serious demo once we just get to the end of this little talk. I just want to show you the last slide here, removing them. We've got a table here for the, fun the commands you need to use to put things on and take things off the front and back of arrays, which is pretty ha handy stuff. Um, you will need this all the time when you're dealing with arrays. I'm going to use some of them in a minute. We did this, modifying elements in the array. We can print them, we tried that out. Uh, we can have two more little concepts which are important. We can have arrays within arrays, two-dimensional arrays. That's where things start to get wiggy, but um, you can do it. You can have arrays within arrays within arrays, oh my. You can just have arrays all the way down if you want. Um, but if you're trying to think of a square of numbers, then you can have uh, it as an array. And in fact, I think there's a in P5, there's a thing called pixels, which gives you a two-dimensional array of all the pixels on a screen, p5.js. Uh, Dot org. Is that right? I'm kind of riffing here. I think that's what it used to be called in in um, processing. Oh yeah. Load pixels will give you a uh, essentially no no it's a one dimensional array. Yeah, sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> I thought it gave you a two dimensional array. No. Nope. It's like each row just all added up together. Yes, that's different. Okay, anyway, you can use two-dimensional arrays to define kind of an image if you want. Like each row could be, each of the first element, um, the first index could be the rows of pixels, and the second Im index could be the columns of pixels within that row. So if we've got a 2D array like this, one, three, comma, two, comma, four, then the first element will be this first subarray, which is has two elements, and element zero, and then element one after that would be three, I think, because it's going to take this first, the zeroth element, that's zero element, then the first element. So that's handy. And then the second one, and this is the, probably the most important one. I'm going to show you in a minute is combining for loops with arrays and this is where things get exciting because our for loop gives us a built-in variable to iterate over which we can use as the index for our array and then we can use the length of an array something dot length as the kind of the limiting factor of that so if the array is 50 elements long we're going to be looping over i equals zero up until the 50th element of the array, which has the index minus one, which will be 49. So that means we can use i equals zero, semicolon, i less than odd numbers dot length. That would be i less than 50. And then the update in the iterator by adding one each time. I'll show you that in a minute. I'm now at the end of my content for the day. So I'm gonna show you how to do some of this stuff and make a better um, bug sketch for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I suppose. So if you have to scoot, that's fine, but there's a bit of further reading and watching to work on. And as I mentioned before, assignment two is out, so you can go and jump into that. All right, back to the bugs. So let's go back to my making a few bugs. I'll make a hundred. And I'm going to get rid of this stuff about odd numbers. I've got a hundred bugs here. And I probably, what I probably want to do is to store these bug locations <laughs> and then draw them all. So what I'm going to do is instead of making, um, whoops. yep, I will. Yep, yeah, yeah, I was just asked if I'm gonna post the bug script in the, the bug code uh, in the thread at the end, but don't run away because I need a few of you to give me ideas as we're going. Um, I think I'm gonna make three arrays. One's gonna be for the bug 
X's. Bug XS is going to be for the, all of the X locations of the bugs. And I'm going to make that an empty array. And then var bug Y's, that's going to be an empty array too. Array too. And then var bug B's, that's going to be an empty array. And then I need another variable. This is going to be an important one, var num bugs. <laughs> Which kind of sounds like a Christmas carol, doesn't it? Var num bugs. <laughs> that's what uh, Ebenezer Scrooge might say. Var num bug. Bar humbug. Okay. We've got my, it doesn't have to be an empty array, it should be a number. You fool, Charles. I want a, a hundred bugs to start with, that'll be good. And my first uh, loop is going to go up to var numbugs, and it's not going to draw them. I'm going to do another loop in here to draw them. This one's not going to draw them, it's going to set up their locations. So I'm going to say bug x's dot push, I'm going to put in a number at the end, which will be its position, random width bug, and then similarly for bug y's, push in a number at the end, random height. So a random location in the x direction on the screen, a random location in the y direction on the screen. That's good so far. And then bug v's will have a the same as I was using before, 150 plus random 100. And that's going to get pushed on the arrays. Uh, just going to comment that out for now. Is this going to work? So far, it's not very happy. Numbugs is not defined. I did define numbugs. Oh, it's not defined here. I've already had my first scoping error. I needed to make these. If I want to use these variables in both setup and draw, which I, I want to do here, that's fine. I really need to put them up here at the top. Now, there's nothing really wrong with having global variables like this, particularly in P5. It's a good way of having variables that are work between both um, locations, but you only want to do it for variables that need to be used in both setup and draw, and you probably that means that they're an important variable. So something like numbugs is going to be important. Something like all the x locations of the bugs, that's really important. Same as all these other ones. So it's fine to have a few here, but they should be important. So I'm just put a comment here. Set up bug locations and brightness. Cool. Nothing wrong with my code so far. Let's draw these bugs. Draw bug. And instead of generating a new place for it, I'm going to get it from bug X's. I'm going to use I. That's the, the counter here. This for loop has a variable I. This one also has a variable I. No problem there, they're in different scopes, so they're not going to interfere with each other. Bug Y's, I. Bug B's, I. So we, instead of generating new ones each time, we've saved this important data in three arrays, and we can get back to it by its number, which is going to be help us so far, because now we can use our bugs in the draw loop without them jumping all over the screen uncontrollably. We can store their location and brightness um, for the whole sketch. Now, the reason I want to draw the bugs in the draw loop is that I want to animate them. And I can't animate them unless I'm drawing them over and over again once each frame. So perhaps I might want to change the brightness of them in time. So there, we were doing a few nice things with brightness last time, I think. Um, what I might do is change bug by B's eye to be bug B's eye, maybe like minus 10 plus random 20. So it can go up, it can get higher and be brighter, it can go lower and be darker. 
but it will just be sort of changing kind of slowly. Hopefully kind of twinkling. There we go. That's cool. Maybe I want them to move a little bit as well. I'm going to do one of these for the X's and one of them for the Y's. But I suppose I only want them to move a tiny bit if they're going to move at all. So I'm just going to say minus one plus random two. Hmm. Three. So they can either be stay the same, move one to the left or down up and or get bigger because the output of random three could be zero, one or two, I think. Oh, now they're all just mainly going forward. That's not what I wanted. Hmm. Someone's going to jump in the chat and tell me what to do in a minute. But first of all, I've forgotten my background, which is not helpful. Why are they all going away? That's not right. <laughs> okay, that, that was right. Here we go, some blinky bugs or slightly fadey, cummy, backy bugs that also jiggle in space and they never jiggle. They can move eventually if they're lucky, but they're not gonna jiggle too far away. That's kind of neat. I might make them, they're each a slightly different size each time, but I might make it so that they're, whoops, start a bit smaller and have more, <laughs> more uh, options. Oh, with a negative lower bound, does that work? I'm just going to look in the, while we're, while we're looking in the reference. Random. Oh, you can have a min and max. That's good. I should have thought of that. I'm just used to languages where you don't have min and max. So I can, should really be doing this. Absolutely right, Jarvis. I'll do minus 10 is the min and plus 10 is the max. That's better, one, one. Oh, that's nicer. Cool, I haven't seen your name tag yet, Jarvis. I'll have to search it out um, to, to see what you're up to and copy your cool twinkly star technique. So this is really nice now. We've got a way of storing our individual bug locations. Now there was, there was something I wanted to try with like, with draw loop. So I really want them to pulse over time. Do we have a way to do pulsing? I think we do that in a lab. Uh, with like sign and cause maybe. Cause, that's a method. I multiply them by cause of the frame count. Will that do anything? Cause frame counts. Maybe they're gonna go too fast here or something. Oh. Oh, is it? Mm, hmm. Oh, divided by 1000. Good idea. Just get that rid of that and try this by itself for the moment. <laughs> this is not helpful yet, Benedict. <laughs> Maybe I need to, to multiply it by 255. How about that? 255 times, just as you've said, 
Oh, here we go. So that's pulsing. I want them to be faster. And now I want them to start in different times. So maybe I'm going to make another var, which is going to be bug um, like starting points. That's going to be a. Um... Oh, I really don't need to do that. I can use bug starting bees anyway. I'll make another local, very local variable. Let brightness uh, bug brightness equal, oops, this one. Uh, sign of that with an offset. Of our original bug bees. Whoops. So now I'm probably getting a little bit abstract. I'm kind of thinking on the fly here. I didn't prepare this idea, so I don't know if we're uh, if it's useful or not. Bug brightness, and we don't need to do modify that. Oh yeah, that's cool. Nice one, yeah. I'm gonna make them a little bit less, maybe. You can also take the bug bees out. Oh yeah, that's what I want. Twinkly bugs. Twinkly, twinkly bugs. Full screen that. Oh. Refresh. Now, just like I said, we wanted to have lots of bugs. So now that I've made my code work with arrays, loops, and functions, and some global variables, we've actually worked on all three code um, topics in this little demo, right? We've done some scope. We've done functions with the draw bug function. And we've done... Um, the the arrays as well. Actually, maybe I should fix this so that the blinking is built into the function. That would be better, wouldn't it? I take that out. The more, if we're doing something to every one of these little drawings, we may as well put it in the array, in sorry, in the function, and then it's out of our code, which is, which is excellent. Bug bees. Maybe it's excellent. I don't know. This is one way of doing it. Give myself ten thousand bugs. One thousand bugs to start with. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I'll make them smaller. or more slightly different sizes. A thousand blinking bugs. Well, I think that's all I've got time for. I'm gonna post, post my little sketch in the chat. Um, they're not social distancing, they certainly aren't. And they, they could be virus particles. We'll just make them green instead. <laughs> Um, there we go. They are nasty germs instead of bugs. That's all I've got time for. I will see you folks on Teams during Tony's lecture and I'll see you next week. I guess 
the teaser for next week is that right now we have to have three separate arrays for all the aspects of our bugs. But next week we'll learn how to put all of those aspects into one thing so we can kind of make a new uh, container to store all the information about a bug that's called an object. And we can then, rather than having to have multiple arrays, we can have one array for all of our objects and refer to each bug individually, which is going to be much more fun. So that's what we're going to do next week. But for now, I'll leave you with the bugs and wish you a very good afternoon. And you can go get started with assignment two. Why not just spend all your time doing 17, 20, 67, 20? I'm sure you don't have anything else to do. That's a lie. I know everyone has lots to do. So have a great time this week. I'll catch you all later.